Des Moines, Iowa. It is Joel and Luke here with The King of Country with some incredibly exciting news. Yes, this fall, The King and Country Live, The Unsung Hero Tour. We're going to play some of your past favorites, new favorites, maybe even a Christmas song. An all-new production that has really been 30 years in the making. You are invited to have a family member, a friend, to thekingcountry.com for tickets. We'll see you there. Welcome into the Channel Seed Studios for Bigger Than 12. Bigger Than 12 is brought to you by Wealth Charter Retirement Planning and Tax. I'm Jake Brand, joined by Derek Duke on Wednesday, October the 2nd. Derek, how are you, my friend? Doing good, man. It's uh, it's officially spooky season. It's It's October, man. It's one of my favorite months of the year, so... I'm excited. Uh, another great weekend of football we had. We had plenty of surprises and another great weekend on deck. I'm I'm really getting used to the uh, whole Big 12 after dark thing. And I absolutely love every minute of it. I also want to give a shout out to our great listeners. Got some more feedback uh, on the show and I'm, I'm just so happy y'all could join us. Is October the best month? I think it's it is. Debatable. It's certainly debatable when you got uh, baseball going, playoff uh, postseason baseball going. Um, and then obviously a college football NFL is in full swing. I think the NBA doesn't the NBA start in, in October as well, late October. Yeah. I know the, the Blackhawks start next Tuesday. Uh, so you're, so you're a hockey guy too. So, so hockey, I think hockey starts like a week or two before the NBA, but nonetheless, it, I know in Iowa, October is easily the best month in general, just weather wise going to a football game. There's nothing quite like, a 55 degree high on a Brocktober Saturday in Ames. Like that is, that's about as good as it gets, but uh, I just, you're just bragging now. Cause you know, I'm going to be still sweating my ass off. And well, it's hot here too. It, it cooled down, it cooled down for one day, but we're still in the high seventies up here in Iowa. And it is, yeah, it's Brocktober and it's still hot, but uh, as always, thank you so much to our, Presenting sponsor, Wealth Charter Retirement Planning and Tax. And what I love about Wealth Charter is they're always putting the interests of their clients first. The reason they started this was to act um, for their clients and to provide a high degree of knowledge for retirement rules, social security planning, tax rules, investments, stuff way above my pay grade and Derek's pay grade. And uh, I mean, the nice part about this as a sponsorship is not only is it for everybody, but it's also for any time because right now you could be in the retirement planning stages of your life because that can be literally any time of your life, whether you're retired, whether you are a recent college grad, a business owner, like Wealth Charter always, always has the services and knowledge for you. And then I know tax season isn't until April, but you can never be too early on getting your taxes done or even to start thinking about them. So pair with the team of Tim Hawkins, Bryce Littler, and the entire Wealth Charter team at uh, wealthcharterretirement.com, or they've got an office in Ankeny, so you can uh, schedule yourself an appointment with them in Ankeny, locally, locally owned, locally run, and they're helping this good local program here on Iowa everywhere. Thanks, as always to Wealth Charter for being on board. We're going to change up the 12 pack a little bit this week. Nothing too crazy. I think it's going to enhance it. And I don't know why we didn't go to this sooner, but Aiden is going to come in and act almost as a moderator for the 12 pack. And yeah, it's welcome. We're handing it all over to you, Aiden. Thanks fellas. Be careful. All right. Yeah. Right. Should we dive into it? Yeah, let's do it. Let's get all right. It. First full weekend of Big 12 play. Jake, who was the most impressive team of the weekend? It's Colorado. Uh, 14 and a half point underdogs to go in and win a road game by multiple scores in dominant fashion. For a guy that's been as 
critical as I have been, because I've been really, 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 really critical of Colorado, I've gone as far to say, ah, they might be a two win team. Well, they've already surpassed that. They're four and one on the season. It was a very impressive win. Travis Hunter proves that he's the best player in the country. He hit the Heisman pose, give the man his Heisman. And then Shadur Sanders showed what he can do when he has time in the pocket. And I got to say that one, they ran the ball. They stopped the run. Colorado looked like they had legitimate power five line play in the trenches for the first time since coach prime got there. And it looked like something that was sustainable. I, I was super, super impressed by Colorado. I'm going to go with the team that I've also kind of been selling the last few weeks, which is Arizona. The Wildcats beat Utah 23 to 10 in Salt Lake City, a city, and they really impressed me. Uh, I know Cam Rising was out, but their defense did a great job shutting down Utah's run game and really forced Isaac Wilson to try to beat them with his arm, which obviously he could not do at all. Offensively, they're more of an air and out kind of team with Fafita, but I thought they did a really good job establishing the run in that game, and I actually felt like they could have maybe ran the football even more in that game, but. Overall, I came impressed. Uh, I was impressed with the Wildcats and the way they handled themselves on the road. Yeah, finally, I look smart. Yeah, <laughs> I still I never sold that stock. I, I know we'll get into that <laughs> a little more in a bit. All right, Derek, sticking with you. Let's flip it to the reverse. Most disappointing team of the weekend. For me, it's Oklahoma State. They pulled another no show on both sides of the ball against Kansas State in their 42 to 20 loss and Alan Bowman, I just feel like we're just crapping all over Alan Bowman every single week on this show. But, I mean, we kind of have to. I mean, completed just 50% of his passes and turned the ball over twice. Ollie Gordon was once again a non-factor outside of one decent run he had. But defensively, they weren't any good either. They, they gave up 300 rushing yards to Kansas State, and it seems like they've taken steps back on this defense despite returning so much production. And, you can say really the same about the entire team because offensively they have a lot of pieces back and it just it has not come together for this team at all. They are just completely in shambles. They almost remind me a little bit of, of Kansas a little bit. Yeah, their their fan base is not happy with their offensive and defensive coordinator at all. I I saw one fan say like I know what it feels like to have one of the five worst offensive coordinators in the sport. I don't know what it feels like to have two of the five worst coordinators in the sport. And they're certainly going through it. Something's wrong in Stillwater and something's also wrong in Lawrence, which is my most disappointing team. Whether you you want to say it's the loss, the dwindling crowd at Arrowhead Stadium, or just the total outlook of the season, Ooh. it's going to be a long one in Lawrence. And I, I think we've really said all we can say about that football team on this program. I don't, know what's left to say other than I don't know if they'll be my miss my most disappointing team again because I just I don't expect anything out of them the rest of the way it's fair to say that's fair to say at this point because Kansas much like Oklahoma State completely trending in the wrong direction over the last few weeks uh Kansas State came up big like you guys said against Oklahoma State put the pounding on the Cowboys are they the new favorites of the Big 12 Jake Vegas would say yeah, slightly, but I'm still going to say it's Iowa State. So I'd say Saturday showed me two things. One, we already talked about Oklahoma State's bad. Don't need to spend any more time on them. But it also showed me that K-State is who I thought they were. I think they proved that that BYU game was just really, really weird in rewatching it. It's probably a game they win eight or nine times out of ten. Just, again, we broke it down. Just everything that went wrong, anything that could have possibly went wrong, did go wrong. I I do think K-State is one of the two best teams in the Big 12 when you pair their just dynamic rushing attack, a pretty good defense, and then Avery Johnson, who... I think had his best game so far as a as a D1 player. It, it's all there for K-State, but they've just got less margin for error than than a team like Iowa State because they already do have that loss. 
I thought you were going to pull a Dennis Green and hit the table when you said I, they are who we thought they were, but you didn't do that. <laughs> so I'm a little disappointed in you, but I wouldn't say they're they're my favorite to win the Big 12, but they're certainly in the top two or three. With this team, what we're, what we're watching right now is Avery Johnson grow up before our very eyes. He was efficient. And he did a good job of taking care of the football and didn't really turn. He had one mistake, but he didn't really make another one after that, which is something that didn't happen in Provo a couple weeks ago. I also felt like he had a really nice balance to his game. He ran the ball efficiently. He threw the ball efficiently. He kind of had that good mix that you want to see from a, a mobile quarterback. And, and Kansas State has the big the defense to be a Big 12 title contender. As I said many times on the show, it's just going to come down to Avery Johnson managing the offense. He doesn't need to be the hero out here for them to win a Big 12 title. He just needs to be a really good game manager, which is something that Alan Bowman, who we're going to talk about, can't do. Yeah, they are... He's just in the position of don't make the the unthinkable play happen because that's what happened in Provo. And that's why I'll still lean Iowa State over K-State, just barely. Good stuff, fellas. Uh, speaking of Alan Bowman, it's, it's time to have a difficult conversation, I think. Derek, do you think that Oklahoma State should start looking at a backup? At this point, I, I don't know what else they're going to have to do. So, I mean, why not? I mean, maybe give Garrett Rangel a try or, or another chance and maybe Zane Flores. But I'm not sure how much that will fix because this offensive line of theirs is struggling. But at least one of those two quarterbacks is probably more accurate than Alan Bowman at this point. Get this. Bowman currently has the lowest completion percentage in his career this season. And without that game against Tulsa where he threw five touchdown passes, he would have just as many touchdowns as interceptions. This team will not win a Big 12 title with Alan Bowman at quarterback. And the sooner they realize the sooner they realize that, the sooner they're going to make the move and kind of maybe get going in the right direction. But again, Alan Bowman's just not the guy. I think we've learned that the hard way. Yeah, there's been all this talk about how the rushing attack just isn't the same as it was last year. And I think you can place a ton of that blame on Bowman. He's been way too inaccurate, and it's completely hindering their rushing attack. If if Bowman can't hit a simple three-yard slant, if he's overthrowing the guy, defenses don't feel the need to respect the passing game. And it's resulting in stacked boxes against Ollie Gordon. And when Ollie Gordon's neutralized, that is not a good football team. And I know we haven't seen a ton from Garrett Rangel. We saw a little bit last year, and it, it hasn't been great. But I got to think whatever they can get from him, whether it's better, the same, or a little worse, you'd think maybe the just the idea in their head of having a new quarterback can provide an added boost of momentum uh, if they were to make the change. I saw something where it, his uh, Alan Bowman's fiance was on a bachelorette party, and that was a game against Tulsa where he threw five touchdown passes, so... There was a movement by Oklahoma State fans to maybe send her out uh, out of town every weekend so you can play better. Well, la <laughs> so last night I couldn't fall asleep, and I do what what a normal person does. I'm watching Iowa State Texas Tech back in 2018 when Alan Bowman was starting at quarterback at Jack Trice cool. Stadium as a freshman. What just six years ago? Not that long ago, and it was a 31-31 game in the fourth quarter, and Bowman dropped the snap, runs back, and tries to throw it away, but they call it intentional grounding in the end zone safety to essentially lose the game. Like, if if I'm just an alien who came down on Earth and you told me that <laughs> that, that game was last weekend, I would have believed you because 24-year-old Alan Bowman is making the same exact mistakes as 18-year-old Alan Bowman. For sure. Uh, Utah, ranked in the top 10 last week, obviously fell out of the top 10, loses a stunner at home to Arizona. Jake, what do you make of the Utes' first loss at home? I've got two takeaways. I'll start with Utah. And I think Utah is just good without Cam Rising. They're a good football team. But good to me is 8-4, and four, maybe 7-5, and 9-3. and three. But without their quarterback, that's what they are. And Isaac Wilson is a fine 
back up. He started seven of seven, finished 13 of 33, and had maybe the worst interception of the year. Just totally didn't see the guy, didn't get enough air on it, and it completely changed the game. And when he was playing well in that first quarter, they were moving the ball, but just could not capitalize on the red zone trips they had at all. And the defense, it's good, but it's not good enough to like holding Arizona to 23 points is a good day. They're going to need more out of the offense, but as much blame as I can put on Utah, I think Arizona deserves worlds of credit. Noah Fafita was finally the best player on the field. That's the first time that's happened this season. He was incredible. He had no fear, and that's what they're going to need. And I think Isaac Wilson's bad day might be inflated by just how good Arizona was on defense. Uh, Takario Davis had five passes defended, and when I went and looked at that stat, that felt low. Wilson was throwing decent balls, and Arizona's DBs were just better. So all that to say, I I don't want to overreact to Utah's loss, but they need cam rising back or else like they're pretty much on the same they're pretty much on the same playing field as arizona in my opinion without without him at quarterback no and i'm glad you gave arizona some credit there because they played exceptionally well uh, as i mentioned earlier and no fafita he almost reminded me a little bit of patrick mahomes the way he was escaping throughout the, throughout the oh pocket. it was it was beautiful and and just dropping downfield dimes it was actually it's a great thing to watch and like you said, their defenders, their corners, and their safeties were just all over the place on Saturday night. But, you know, focusing here on Utah, Utah needs Cam Rising like I need a beer on Friday night. Like you just <laughs> have to have it. <laughs> they have to have him. I thought their defense actually did a decent job. They kept him in the game as, as long as they could. But in the hold to Arizona to 20 points, I think is actually pretty impressive. The problem is just for the offense is not very consistent with Wilson at quarterback. And He's definitely not his brother Zach out there. Let's let's just be honest there. But plus, they couldn't run the football very well against Arizona, which puts even more pressure on Wilson. And I really coming away after this weekend now and looking at Utah's schedule moving forward, I just wonder how bad this hand injury that Cam Rising has. Like, is something broken? Because if there's a coach to hide it out there in the Big 12, it's definitely Kyle Whittingham. Yeah. He would not say a word about this, and he would just make us think every week, like, oh, maybe this is the week that Cam's going to play. But it just hasn't happened yet. So I really wonder what truly is going on with this hand. Yeah, there's there's no more playing around. We've probably set the number at seven wins. Seven and two will probably be everyone's goal because that that's what gets you to Arlington. There's probably – there's probably a world where six and three might be able to get it done depending on how the season shakes out, but there's no more room for error like that. That's it. That's your, that's your mulligan. Utah has to play almost perfect football the rest of the way, or they're not going to get the benefit of the doubt to go into the college football playoff. And they, they really, really need rising. And with this track record, I, are they going to get him? I, if they do get him, is he going to stay healthy? It's it, it's concerning for the folks out in Salt Lake City. The one thing he hasn't stopped doing is cashing those NIL checks, though. Yeah, I know the fan base. I know the uh, always temperate and always rational Utah fan base is not very happy with him. Let's keep it in Utah. BYU holds on against Baylor. I mean, that I thought they were going to blow up personally. Nonetheless, they hang on to move to 5-0. and oh. Are the Cougars a legit Big 12 contender, Derek? By default, yeah, they're a contender, but I'm still not completely sold on this team. Like, they're 5-0, and but they didn't exactly wow me against Baylor uh, after the first quarter. I mean, they were kind of just a dud and really just held on for dear life, but they could have easily lost that game. Like, Baylor towards the end there threw a pick, and they had a chance to go win the game, but they couldn't. they couldn't pull it off. I think they're good enough to win, but like I mentioned before on the show, this team under Kalani Sataki always looks different when they play on the road. They're just a completely different team when they play at Lavelle Edwards Stadium at night, especially at night, compared to like them going to Orlando or to Waco or Fort Worth on a midday game. So to me, there's just too much variance there. We're going to find out a lot more about this team over the next few weeks uh, after their bye because they have to go to Arizona, Oklahoma State, and UCF 
and Utah. UCF and Utah are the games on the road, and that's no cakewalk. Like, are they bet? They're better than what I thought they would be. Yes, but I'm not ra- ready to to crown them, like Danny Green would say. Yeah, they they've still got the conference's most impressive win, in my opinion, just throttling K State. But that Baylor game, they were outgained once again. It's back to back games where they won that they were outgained, and then. Jake Retzloff was their leading rusher. Uh, One that says, yeah, he's he's a good athlete, but he should not be your leading rusher. They've really struggled to establish the run. And then just as a quarterback, Retzloff is fine. He's all right. I still am not ready to anoint them a contender. But then again, could be on my gravestone one day where BYU is 11 and 0 and Jake still hasn't anointed him a contender. I I just need I I know I said it last week. I know I said yeah, I just need to see it one more week, but that that game did nothing for me other than maybe add a little bit of doubt even though they won and I picked them to lose. Does that even make sense? I picked them to lose and I said, "You know what? I need to see it another week." They win and I have more doubt than I did the week before. So you're right. That four game stretch of Arizona, Oklahoma State, UCF, and Utah will tell us all we need to know. If they make it through that stretch three and one, I will certainly come on this podcast and say they're just as much of a contender as anybody. But yeah, we'll, we'll find out at the end of October. Colorado already mentioned them earlier in the show. A lot better than people thought they would be at this point. Uh, let's reset their win total. I believe before the season it was five and a half. Is that right? Yep. Let's reset it at six and a half. Jake, would you take that action? They're they're four and one right now. Their remaining schedule, they host K-State. They go to Arizona. Cincinnati goes to Boulder. A trip to Texas Tech. Utah at home at KU. And then they close the season at home against Oklahoma State. You got to think they should beat Cincinnati at home. So there's five wins right there. So then they need two of K-State, Arizona Tech, KU, Oklahoma State. Think they should be able to beat KU. That puts them at six and six. You know what? I'll go over, Um, which is very, very opposite of what I've been saying all year. I think they're going to have a really tough atmosphere. And that's, I mean, K-State should beat them. But would I feel great picking K-State going out there to a game that's probably going to happen at 10 o'clock at night? I I think they just squeak to that 7-5 and mark. But I still don't don't think there's enough substance there for them to leap into that actual Big 12 contender tier. But at 7-5 and would greatly exceed my expectations. And it would be momentum for that program going forward even if they do lose hunter and lose sanders to the draft i'm taking the over i'm with you they're four and one right now like you mentioned and they would just need to go four and three down the stretch to get to the seven wins and you know three and four three and four excuse me that's correct they still get to play arizona as you said before cincinnati texas tech kansas oklahoma state i could see them win three or four games there i mean like it, it wouldn't surprise me one bit we all know this is the one thing we all know how much talent the skill position has that they have there in Boulder. And it helps when you have two top 20 players with Shadur Sanders and Travis Hunter. And, but what we witnessed on Saturday really impressed me. And that was just, and you said this earlier in the show, Jake, just how physical they were up front on both sides of the ball. Like that's what Colorado has been missing this entire time. Dion has been there. Like if they would have that, that we wouldn't be having conversations about can Dion actually coach or any of these things because all those side distractions, they wouldn't matter because they'd be winning football games. So if they can keep doing what they did on Saturday against UCF, they're going to be a serious threat in this conference. They're going to beat some teams that they're not supposed to. Yeah, they, they've they got a tough schedule. That's, that's what makes it an interesting question is if you give them, I don't know, K-State schedule, which I know we'll talk about in a little bit uh if you give them that schedule yeah I, i'd slam the over but but yeah. with where they're at right now they're they're probably going to go three and four four and three the rest of the way Derek, we're gonna 
throw you a bone here in Lubbock, Texas, home state. Uh, do you see them back in the Big 12 title picture? I believe they are. I said on last week's show that I wouldn't be shocked uh, to see them win eight or possibly nine games this year when you look at the rest of their schedule. Uh, since that Washington game from hell, as I like to call it, their defense has done a better job stopping the run, but they need to figure out how to get to the quarterback because that is really what's hurting them defensively. I believe they only have four sacks on the year, which is, I think, the lowest in the entire conference. But, you know, I really like the way their offense has been playing. Baron Morton is quietly having a career year and is tied for per, uh, first and passing touchdowns the Big 12 with 14 and also, Taj Brooks, my goodness, good luck to defenses trying to stop that guy. It's very rare you see a running back get better as the game goes on, but Brooks does exactly that. So he is the engine of that offense, and he was missing. To be fair, like he was out that Washington State game. They're also down a few offensive linemen. But between Brooks and Morton playing well, there's a really lot of uh, a lot of upside to this team for me. If they can just kind of figure out some things defensively, I think they could be also be one of the Big 12 title contenders. Yeah, it's really hard for me to get that Wazoo loss out of my head. But no. again, there's no Taj Brooks. And it probably proves just how good and how valuable having an elite running back is. And at this point, the conference is too wide open. And the conference is without any elite teams. It It's hard to discount a 2-0 team. And that that's where we're at in this point of the season. You, you got seven more to go. I think they've got to be in the picture, especially considering they've got a swing game coming up against Arizona that I think whoever wins that game, you definitely enter yourself into the legit big 12 title picture. And I think, I think Texas tech is just as good as, as a team like Arizona. They're, they're on that tier and can, they can make a jump, especially if, if Morton continues to play at, at the way he is. But again, yeah, Giving up 42 points at home to Cincinnati doesn't necessarily make me confident in their ability to hit the nine and three mark like they would probably need to. But at the end of the day, that it's kind of a vintage tech team, and that's good for the conference. If you've got tech playing in these 40, 40 and 50s games late in the season, that's, that's what I grew up on. Rest in peace, Mike, Mike Leach. Praise be to thee. The legend. All right. Jake, uh, tr there's trouble in Lawrence. Let let's lay it out there. Do you think Kansas will make a bowl game this year? Basketball season's about 30 days away. <laughs> That's all I'll say to that. They got to win five of seven to get to a bowl game. At Arizona State, against Houston, they could get on a little run there, but then they go to K-State. I'd bet you $100 right now that they lose to K-State. They got to go to Iowa State. Notice how I said to Iowa State, even though it's at Arrowhead. Iowa State will have more fans there. They got to go to BYU. That's a brutal stretch. At home against Colorado and finish the year at Baylor. They'll probably win a couple of those games. I don't think they're going five and two. Um, they got a good basketball team, though. Zeke Mayo's a stud. So uh, th that's where that's where the minds of Jayhawk fans should be right now. When you said that, it reminded me of, I don't know if you remember, Baker Mayfield back in like 2017 when they went to Kansas and Kansas didn't shake, they didn't shake his hand pregame and Baker's like, okay, it's on. And then that was a famous game where, where he grabbed him, grabbed his crotch and he, oh, told yeah. the fans, he told the fans like, go back to cheering basketball. Like I, that kind of reminded me of what you just did there, but I'll say this. Absolutely not. Kansas City at one and four right now, which means they'd have to go five and two to make a bowl game go to get to just to get to six and six. Like, is there anybody out there right now that thinks Kansas can actually do that? Because I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if they are out of bowl contention by the Iowa state game on November 9th. That's how fast I think they could be out of it. Uh, Daniel's not playing well. The crowd was absolutely awful at Arrowhead last weekend and their defense has regressed. Everything that could go wrong for Kansas this season has. And again, maybe that Arrowhead thing, the whole deal with that situation, like maybe they thought, Oh, we're going to be like four and one by that time. We're going to get up huge crowds for this. Like now it just, it looks really stupid on their part to have it. Cause it just looks like a giant empty stadium on their part. Yeah. It looks like the Charlie we stays are back and I'm not, I'm, I'm not being disrespectful to, to Lance Leipold. I think as a program, they're going to recover, 
But from a fan support, it looked like I was watching one of those old 2012 KU teams have 5,000 people in attendance. Brutal. Uh, Rapid fire here, Derek. Buy, sell, or hold TCU, UCF, Arizona, go. Probably unpopular here, but I, I'm going to buy TCU, hold Arizona, and sell UCF. I'm sorry, but the Knights aren't are just doing it for me. I love RJ Harvey, and I think he's a dark horse uh, for the Heisman, but the lack of a passing game from KJ Jefferson is eventually going to bite that team in the ass, and they look like hot garbage defensively against Colorado. I mean, they laid an egg on primetime. Like, big noon kickoff was there. Everybody was there. And the whole country was watching that game, and they just absolutely laid an egg. Arizona is the one team I'm not sure how I really feel about them. Yes, they beat Utah, but you know they have a five game they have a five game stretch here ahead of them where they're going to play Tech, BYU, Colorado, West Virginia, and UCF. Like Ooh. that is a really brutal schedule. And to be fair, like they beat a Utah team without Cam Rising. Like so, how much stock do you really want to put in that? Now I'm going to buy. TCU because out of these three teams, I think they mo- they have the most upside with Josh Hoover and because I like the way that their schedule is set up. And hear this out here. They play Houston on Friday. They get a bye week to prepare for Utah. Then they get Baylor, Tech, and Oklahoma State before finishing with Arizona and Cincinnati. To me, that is a very friendly schedule for TCU. If they can avoid making mistakes with Josh Hoover, who's actually also tied for the Big 12 uh, passing leader in touchdowns, if they can just stop shooting themselves in the foot, I think they can be a Big 12 title contender. I'm going to buy Arizona, sell UCF, and hold TCU. I've already got enough Arizona stock, so why not just buy a little more? I'm No matter what, at the end of the season, I'm going to need to go to our friends over at Wealth Charter because they're either going to be getting me out of debt or they're going to be telling me how to invest my riches that I, that I won on the Arizona Wildcats. I'm with you. I'm selling UCF. I've probably overrated them from the start, which I did last year too. I've learned my lesson. KJ Jefferson is just not good enough to win enough big 12 games. And that, that defense was really, really, really disappointing. And I'm going to hold TCU. I, I agree with you. I feel like I've been a little higher on TCU this year than most. The offense is seemingly getting whatever it wants, but is still having some turnover problems, some very avoidable turnover problems. And then again, I just I don't think KU is good enough right now to be a gauge. So I'm just going to hold the Horn Frogs right now. But I, I like your case that you made for them with the way that schedule opens up for them. To me, they're they're the most difficult team to put a finger on. Like you can't quite gauge what they are just yet. Yeah, it's it's just been a really weird year in Fort Worth between the the huge blown lead and then just the the bizarre rivalry game against SMU. I, I still don't know what to make of them. Jake, what was your biggest takeaway from the first weekend of Big Twelve play? No team is safe. I think Iowa State and K-State are the best two teams in the conference, but there's not a massive gap in between them and the next tier like there is any other conference, whether that's from the team itself or just the talent. You look at the SEC, the talent gap between that of an Alabama, a Georgia, a Tennessee, a Texas, and then you go to the middle of the pack with an Auburn, it is so astronomical. The talent gap between Iowa State and Baylor, uh, there's not much of one at all. Iowa State's way, way, way better coached. They develop players better. They got a better atmosphere. But the margin for a team like Iowa State or K-State, we saw with K-State going to BYU, the, the margin for those schools is just not big enough to have a lot of C to C plus games like Iowa state played down in Houston. And again, we just, we don't know what's going to happen week to week. We've proven that on this show by our picks, especially me. We we don't know what's going to happen. And there's what nine, nine teams. You could still probably see playing in Arlington, which I, I don't think any other conference right now is dealing with, 
with that world of like over half the conference is still well well within reason to be playing for the conference championship. So no no team is safe any night. And no lead is safe for that matter. We've seen that yeah. a few times uh, this year. Sometimes you have to see it to believe it. And what I mean by that is we can sit here and tell you that this or that is going to happen. But in this conference, like there's a good chance, like a 50% chance that the opposite is going to happen. It makes for one hell of a Big 12 title race, but damn, sure, it's sure hard to predict. And we all, we know here all that too well because it's nearly impossible to try and pick this conference every game, as you know, me and Jake here know. But just when you think you have a team or this conference figured out, you're left scrambling once again because it's just so hard to predict. Like it truly is, and I've said this multiple times before that it is the deepest conference and college football. And that uh, we're going to, we're going to crack one for the clones and in just a couple minutes and and I'll tease to it right now. And what you mentioned, you just don't know what you're going to get. That's why I feel like Iowa state is a somewhat safe bet to win the conference because truly of all the teams outside of Houston, Iowa state is probably the, the one, you know what you're going to get the most. You know what you're going to get out of Houston, and it's not good. Um, no. But on the on the good end of things, it feels like Iowa State has the highest floor of any team by a really wide margin. Again, I'd argue they they don't have as high of a ceiling as a K State when things are firing on all cylinders. But but th- that's what makes Iowa State so dangerous, and we're going to talk about their big 12 title chances in in just a minute, but we've got one more beverage to crack open on the 12 pack. Yes. Last one here, guys, Heather Dinich. I don't know if I'm saying that right. uh, Reports that the sec and big 10 are looking at four auto bids. Once the new college football playoff contract starts in 2026, Derek, what are your first thoughts on that? I also had a report that I shared on Twitter. I don't know if you guys saw it, but, the SEC and the Big Ten can go fuck themselves. Uh, it, it's bad enough that we have the playoff committee kissing their ass, and now we automatically they automatically want four teams in. Like, that's bullshit. They should earn their way because that's what you have to do to get in. This is their way of controlling the narrative and that they are head and shoulders above everyone else, and they're also trying to diminish the role of the playoff committee, which is why this whole thing was started in the first place. Like, what are we doing here? Like, four Big Ten teams – are we trying to get Rutgers in the damn playoff or what? Because what's the point of having a conference championship game between these conferences? Because you're going to get two that play in the game. They're already in. And now you want two more teams that aren't good enough to make the championship game. You want them in as well. Like you may, at this point, you may as well just kill the damn playoff and start the whole thing over because this whole controlling bullshit, it's so sick and tiring for me just to see that. The sport is so corrupt at all levels from, from the richest of the rich to just down to the to the average Joe, it, it's it's biased the whole way, and that that starts at the top, and it's just a self fulfilling prophecy. If if you're told all year long, oh yeah, there's gonna be four SEC teams in there, you're just automatically gonna believe that all oh, that the fourth best sec team or the fifth best sec team is better than the winner of the big 12 or the ACC. And some years that might be the case that that very well could be the case this year. I I don't know if Iowa state would finish fourth or better in the sec, but to predetermine that to, to have that built in, it's just not right. And then when you factor in the more nerdy stuff and the fact that ESPN is paying billions and billions and billions of dollars for this TV deal. And then they're wanting to get their teams that they're paying for this TV deal into their TV product. Uh, You can connect the dots right there. It's stacked against the big 12 and the ACC. And there's nothing a guy like me or you can do about it. There's it's something that can only be fixed by people with power and the people with power are not going to fix it. So my advice to a Big 12 fan, to an ACC fan, to an Iowa State fan. Enjoy college football for what it is. 
for me, college football has never been about the national championship. I think the college football playoff, the college football national championship is among the weakest and least interesting of any major American sport. And that's because the regular season is so much better. The regular season is when you get to see a place like Pullman, Washington or Starkville, Mississippi, Piscataway, New Jersey. The cultural differences between these places and fantastic games with differences in styles. The fact that Iowa Northwestern can be played at the same time as Texas Tech Baylor and you can have an over under set at 28 and a half and one set at 75 and a half. That's what makes college football great. And that's what it separates it from the NFL in my mind. So if you're a college football fan, enjoy the 15 weeks that you get from early September to late November, because that's that's what it's about. It's about the memories you get watching those games. It's the memories you get going to those games like. Like what would winning obviously winning a national championship, it should be every fan should be every program's goals but at the end of the day there's what six or seven teams in the country that can do that year in year out enjoy the ride it, it, enjoy it all that that's what i'll say about it that was long-winded no it was good i i, I get what you're saying and i understand it 100 percent, but it, it's just this whole situation just situation just reading those reports extremely and incredibly frustrating for me as you know forget about the media side of this just as a fan of college football in general like it sucks like there's no yeah. there's no other way around it like if you were not locked into the SEC or the Big 10 like this just sucks like if you're an ACC school or a Big 10 school like this is not what you want to be hearing hearing in the morning yeah i should have prefaced that i completely disagree with all of it and i hate it but I I feel like the writing's been on the wall that this has been coming for a few years. So when I saw the report, I was kind of over it already. And I was I'd been preparing for that. So that that's where that's where I just kind of focus on, you know what? Do you know how many times I still watch highlights of the Iowa State TCU game back in 2017? It's like four times a day. <laughs> that's for me, that's what makes college football special. It's games like that. But uh, it's going to do it for the 12 pack. Man, we we drove that car around. Speaking of cars, thanks to our friends at Freedom Tire. Don't don't wait until the weather gets bad to to go get new tires. Do it now so when that first snowfall comes, you're the guy that's driving around on the road like a normal person. You're not one of those morons spinning out on the interstate. Go to Freedom Tire. They've got locations in Altoona, Ames, Fleur Drive, and West Des Mo- in Des Moines. They've got one in West Des Moines, Hickman, and Urbandale. You have to try and avoid a Freedom Tire. So the next time you you pass a Freedom Tire on your way to work, on your way to the restaurant for dinner, stop at our friends at Freedom Tire, or you can go to freedomtire.com. Aiden's got a iowa-based trivia question for us is it um what locations does freedom tire have in in central iowa because i got that nailed down yeah you got that memorized i do not think derek is going to get this one but we're going to try anyway all right (laughs) within five i'll I'll give you some leeway here how many counties are in the state of iowa oh jeez The answer will make you mad. That's my hint. Is it? I don't know. I'm going to go. Oh, geez. 85. So it's 99. Damn it. And if you pull up a map, like I'm sure Aiden is, yeah. Pretty much all equal size. But if you go all the way north and a little bit west, you'll see that Kasuth County is double the size. And I, I should be able to remember why they condensed it, but it used to be a hundred counties and now it's just 99. It's, 
it's stupid. I don't know why they condensed it. It almost, Aiden, looks, like it, it almost looks like a checkered board, you know, the way yeah, the way it's set up. It's actually well, the, maybe the way this map set up that we're looking at here. But yeah, I I, it, I didn't realize how almost even and proportionate each county is in the and entire I, state. I don't know how if this is going to give away any like future trivia questions, but Des Moines is not in Des Moines County. Monroe is not in Monroe County. It's really stupid. It It's quite confusing to the outsider because it's confusing to the insider. It's confusing to the island because there's some like Sac City is in Sac County. So you just, they're always leaving us guessing. Those, I don't, I don't know who, who's in charge of that. I don't know when that started, but Iowa County is about as confusing as it gets. But uh, thank you, Aiden, for that. We're going to crack one for the clones, at least. I know I know Derek is. Absolutely. Got to. Got a question for you. Does Shoot. the Big 12 run through Ames, Iowa? For now, it most certainly does. I mean, who else would you put above Iowa State right now? Utah, Kansas State, BYU? Not for me. I don't. I don't think there's any chance I put put any of those teams above them. Every team in this conference, uh, as we kind of talked about earlier, they have their flaws. But I feel like Iowa State has the least amount of flaws out of any team in the Big Twelve. Like you said, that their floor is pretty high compared to other teams in this conference, and I totally agree with that. They're the most balanced team, in my opinion. Their defense is capable of slowing down good offenses. In the, in the conference, and the offense is capable of scoring on anyone in this conference just because how good they are. You know, and defensively, speaking of the defense, they are playing as well as anyone in the entire country on that side of the ball. But the one thing I worry about with, with this team is exactly what we saw in Houston. It's the slow starts. Like, they scored 31 in the first half against Arkansas State a couple weeks ago. And then they go to Houston and they put up three points in the first half. Like there needs to be more urgency and consistency with the offense. And at times I felt like the play calling was more about not making the big mistake instead of just going out there and attack and attacking the defense, maybe taking those shots down the field that they love to take with Rocco, you know, so t- for me to get this, to get this team where they need to be, they need to clean that up. And, and, you know, I might be nitpicking here, but, you know, to be the best, you have to be good across the po- a board in every phase of the game if you're going to be a serious Big 12 title contender. And obviously, as we all know, we're going to find out a lot more of this about this team because if you look at that schedule of theirs, you know, if you just circle the last two games on the schedule, it's, you know, uh, Utah and Kansas State. Like, those two games have a really good chance of determining, you know, whether or not that, that Iowa State gets to Arlington or not. Yeah, the slow starts is is really weird. I I started to kind of make a note of it against Arkansas State, especially slow starts for Rocco Becht in general. Just a lot of overthrows. I, I know we've talked about it a lot. And the I guess the optimist in me has kind of come up with somewhat of a diagnosis to where Iowa State just hasn't played a normal game yet. So you've got the season opener, which is always weird. Then you go to Iowa and your first snap is at the one yard line. You take a bye week and then you start with another cupcake and it almost feels like another season opener and then a big 12 opener in front of an empty stadium. So I, I, that's not an excuse or, or a reason or anything, but I'll be interested to see what it's like this week coming out with so much juice. Jack Trice is going to be on fire. I'll I'll be excited to see if Iowa State can start fast. But back to the original question of does the Big 12 run through Ames? Yeah, I I think it does. Iowa State's going to be probably six plus point favorites in every game they play until they go to Salt Lake City. You're expected that... What that tells me is you are expected to be 10-0. and 0. I know that uh, a lot of Iowa State fans are probably holding onto their butts right now because that that is a pretty jarring statement. But with how the schedule lines up, and trust me, I know. We already talked about it. Talent-wise, the, the margin isn't huge between an Iowa State and a Baylor, a Tech, a 
heck, even at a West Virginia or a Kansas at this point. But if Iowa State does play like they're capable for the next six games, there's a very real world where they could be 10 and 0 with the chance to win the Big 12. And again, it's, I, I keep coming back to that balance where the defense has definitely exceeded expectations. I still need to see them play uh, a real offense because the two power five opponents that they've played have been Iowa and Houston, not exactly the best barometers for high powered offenses, but even then anytime you can pitch a shutout in the big 12, that's pretty impressive. And the offense has, has probably not been clicking as much as expected. So what happens if it does start clicking the, I think Iowa state is just scratching the surface of, of what they could be. And if they do reach their full potential, I don't, I don't see a way where they aren't playing in our in Arlington. Well said, well said, which it's crazy times. But again, Iowa state is finally on an equal playing field for the first time in the history of the institution. They're not going up against a program like Texas or Oklahoma that has a hundred times the resources as them. And they're not going up against another coach in the big 12 that will consistently out coach you. I mean, Kyle Whittingham is a is a great coach. Mike Gundy has the history. Chris Chris Kleiman's a great coach, but I think it's it's fair and normal to throw Matt Campbell in all of those same conversations as those guys. And when you've got a coach on the top tier in your conference, that means you've got a shot every single week. And it's it's an exciting time in Ames, and it it just bodes well for the future, I believe, beyond. 2024 and speaking of uh bad history there's been some pretty bad quarterbacks that have that have started games in Ames. we'll see if aiden gives us one of those in our random big 12 quarterback segment i honestly don't know if this guy started in Ames. i don't think he did um anyway this player started his career in the big 12 was later the SEC Newcomer of the Year and has put together an okay-ish NFL career as a backup quarterback. Okay, you're going to have to repeat that one to me one more time. The last one? I guess I'll guess all of it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so he started his career in the Big 12. Okay was later the SEC Newcomer of the Year and has put together a decent NFL career as a backup quarterback. Do you want to you want to try to guess that one Jake? I think I have an idea of who it may be. Aiden gave us like a subtle fourth hint saying he doesn't know if he's played in Ames. Which Aiden, did the did he play in the state of Texas? Yes. Did he play in Waco? Maybe. Is it Jared Stidham? It is. There we go. He is a decent NFL backup. He went. I remember the stats he went aren't to great, but he he has a career. Auburn. He went to Auburn. I right after the after he went to Baylor. I think he went to Auburn. Yep. Yeah, he went to so Auburn. The, then he went to like the Patriots for a little while after that, I think, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yep. He, yeah. So he was on Auburn 2017 and 2018. 2017 is when he won Newcomer of the Year. Um, yeah. Second team I, All SEC that year, too. Did he, I remember, did I remember he start he, at Baylor? Like, he, so he, he started as the did. backup. Yeah. By like so, 2015, he was like the guy there because I remember like. Because uh, that was when Petty was still. Was that when Petty was Petty done no. in fourteen? Petty was done in fourteen. So, Stidham yeah. would have been the next year. Mm -hmm. I think okay. Seth Russell might have yes. been the quarterback. Good pull. There. Yes. Um, and then Stidham. Stidham was like a legacy guy uh in the state of Texas because I think Stidham comes from Stephenville and like 
when Art Bryles was at Waco, at like guy. yeah, it's Art Bryles was the former head coach at Stephenville back in the nineties. We're talking like Texas high school football history now, but he was at Stephenville for a while and won a few state championships in Stephenville, and that's where Stidham actually came from. And then of course he followed uh, Bryles to uh, to Waco. I think Stidham was like the number one quarterback in the state that year, if I'm not mistaken. I guess I didn't know Stidham started at Baylor. Yeah. But, so he would have been pre Bonex Auburn. Oh yeah. Yes. I'm pretty so sure. He, he yeah. Would. He probably would have been the last starter before. Yes. Before Bonex. Okay. Yeah. I, if Aiden didn't like accidentally give a hint about not knowing if he played in Ames, I was maybe going to guess Spencer Rattler. Cause I know once he went to South Carolina, he, he was pretty he was good. So I wasn't, yeah. I wasn't sure if he won newcomer of the year, but I know Aiden wouldn't question if he started a game in Ames because that was one of my most memorable memories. So the the 2020 Iowa State Oklahoma game, that was the first game back at Jack Trice where they allowed fans. And I just remember I'm at home like an hour before kickoff and I had just picked up pizza to watch the game with my family and Aiden texted me. He's like, Hey, I got an extra ticket. If you want to go, I was out the door in seconds. And I remember parking at vet med. It's like probably three quarters of the mile away from the stadium. And I took one of those bikes. I Venmo a guy and I <laughs> sat, I sat in the back of some guy's bike and I made it into my seats by kickoff. And, uh, yeah, we, we we sat right behind the OU bench and heckled Spencer Rattler and DeMarco Murray the entire game. The entire game. That's pretty funny. So yeah, and thanks for the tickets. It's like <laughs> however many years later, four years later. But uh let's close with some big twelve picks. I had a three and four week. Derek had a four and three week. I'm getting there. I'm at thirty percent. Thirty percent of the season. Sorry, I think I, I did, two games I didn't over five hundred. I didn't mean to whisper, but uh, yeah, I th- I think I'm starting to get my my feel though. My locks have hit the past couple weeks, and my my actual money that I'm like the the Big Twelve games that I'm actually feeling good about, I've started to hit. But there's a couple this week. Honestly, this week I don't know if I have a lock because it's just a weird slate. So let's start. With a Friday night game, six six thirty on ESPN, Houston goes to TCU, and the Horn Frogs are seventeen point favorites with the over under at forty nine and a half. I know Houston hadn't scored a point in their last one hundred and twenty seven minutes of football, but that is still one high spread. If TCU can avoid turning the ball over, they could easily win by twenty. I'm not. I'm just not sure if they can do that or they're capable of that with Hoover, but. I think I feel more comfortable here taking the under at 49 and a half. So Houston won't score more than 14 in this game. And I don't think TC will score more than 31 because Houston's defense, you know, we make fun of Houston all the time, but they're somewhat respectable as we kind of found out against that Iowa State game. So I'm going to take the under. Yeah, they've got some athletes on defense, should be able to neutralize guys like Batch. I think Houston will score. Not enough, though, to hit the over. I'm going to go under with you. Next game is West Virginia at Oklahoma State. It's a bit of a loser leaves town type of game. The Pokes are getting four and a half points at home. Over under set at 65 and a half for this three o'clock kickoff on ESPN2. That spread is way too high for my liking. West Virginia is going to slow the game down with their ground attack. And I'm not sure if Alan Bowman is capable of even throwing a forward pass at this point. Uh, I honestly have no clue who's going to win this game, but... Uh, it's going to depend on which Oklahoma State st- uh, team shows up uh, on Saturday. So I, I think I'm going to take the under here once again. I think that's the better play in this game. I have no idea who's going to win, but I'm just going to fade Alan Bowman until I can anymore. Okie State could win, but it could be by a field goal. Uh, I just I, f- I feel better picking against Alan Bowman than any other pick in this conference currently. That's fair. And is this our last non-conference game of the entire season as UCF goes to Gainesville to take on the Florida Gators? UCF is favored by two and a half 
the over under at 61 and a half for a night game on SEC network. That spread is also high, but I'm not a coward and I'm not going to take the under three times in a row. So uh, Florida, they have the second worst rush defense in the SEC and the Knights are going to run right at them with Jefferson and Harvey and Florida's uh, offense. They don't scare me at all. UCF going to have a bounce back weekend. So give me the Knights to cover. UCF road games can be barn burners, and I'm going to play on that trend. I think UCF will win, but I feel way, way more safe playing the over in this game. It, it could get up into the 40s with with how UCF struggles to stop teams on the road and with how uh, Florida stop struggles to stop teams at any point of the year. This is a... This is a game that I... I if I would have told you this six weeks ago... I don't think you would have believed this line. Kansas goes to Tempe to take on Arizona State, and the Sun Devils are favored by three at home with the over-under at 50 and a half, a 7 o'clock game on ESPN2. I don't trust Kansas or Jalen Daniels at all, especially on the road now, and that's what this game's going to come down to me. Arizona State's got a good defense, and they can run the football. Kansas on the road, that's a no-go for me, so... I'm going to take my chances with Arizona State covering at home in this one. This one's strength on strength. Arizona State, they have the 13th best rush defense in the nation, just two and a half yards per rush allowed. But no one has really stopped Devin Neal and Daniel Hyshaw yet. But I do think the Sun Devils can do it just enough to neutralize the KU offense. I'll take the Sun Devils to cover the three in a, man, could be a disaster if, if KU lost that game. Ooh, one two games left staying in the state of Arizona big 12 after dark 10 o'clock on Fox Texas Tech at the Wildcats in Arizona they're favored by six at home with the over under at 62 and a half yep shout out to uh, I want to give a shout out to Arizona Desert uh, Swarm for letting me preview this game with them so and if you read their article then you already know my pick but for those who didn't uh, I said that this has a classic Big 12 shootout type of feel to it. And for this game to be played in Tucson, that just seems fitting for that for that moment. So scoreboard's going to be working overtime, and I'm taking the over on this one. I think it's going to be a really high-scoring game out in Tucson. I'm going to guess Arizona is the trendy play for the public. Just got to win by a touchdown. I'm going to go the other way. I think this is probably a good letdown spot in a game that I think is going to develop into a really fun rivalry in the big 12. I'm just going to take Texas tech plus six. I don't expect them to win, but I I think it should get weird. It should get really weird and tech tech can keep it close on the road. And we're going to close with what else? Iowa state, the 16th ranked team in the big 12 or the 16th ranked team in the country the only Big 12 ranked team playing this week, which makes for a bit of a weird slate, is favored by 13 and a half points at home against Baylor with the over under at 45 and a half. 630 on Fox, a wide out in Ames. Derek, I know you might have some fun, so I'm going to go first. I think Iowa State covers. Coming off of the BYU game, man, they, Baylor, was dead for rights down 21 zero and then used so much energy to get back in that game. Use so much energy to maybe save Dave Aranda's job. I don't know if they will be able to recover from that emotional roller coaster. I think it could be a, a classic night game at Jack Tri stadium where Iowa state is firing on all cylinders. I think the Cyclones win by two or more touchdowns and Dave Aranda doesn't make it off the plane. Save this one for last because this one feels like a little close to home for me because my brother, he actually went to Baylor and he's turned my mom into a Baylor fan as well. And if you can watch on here on the show, they thought it was a good idea to give me this Baylor fishing shirt. I don't know if you could see it here, but they, oh, man. I have not, I have not worn this thing one damn time. And guess what? I never will. I'm getting this piece of crap out of here. Jack Trice will be rocking. Juicy Wiggle will be blaring. Give me this Cyclones by a freaking billion, man. Does, uh, 
do any sports books offer a billion spread? They don't, but if they did, I would take it. <laughs> yeah, I I have a feeling that it'll be the next week for Iowa State where uh where the concerns could be real when they go to Morgantown. I I don't have my I don't have too many fears about Baylor coming into Ames. I, I think Iowa State rolls. But uh Derek has been nice enough. He's almost felt bad that I have yet we're in what week six and I've yet to win a week of picks. So he just said, you know what? Talk whatever talk about whatever you want to talk about because because I'm getting sick of doing it. So appreciate it. Appreciate the pity. Uh, I'm gonna talk about Brock Purdy. I know uh we're a big 12 show, but we can talk about whatever we want at the end of here. So I don't know how much NFL you've been watching on Sundays, but there is some bad, bad quarterback play. Completion percentage is way up, which you would think indicates good quarterback play. No, it in, it indicates horrible quarterback play because these coordinators do not trust these quarterbacks to go downfield. Well, while that is the case for 15 to 20 quarterbacks in the National Football League, Brock Purdy has gone against the grain. Purdy ranks second in passing yards per game, which is impressive. But here is what I find the most impressive. He is first in yards per attempt. He is first in attempts of 30 plus yards, 20 plus yards, and 10 plus yards, all of those. And he leads, I know, the, this is a wordy stat. Purdy leads in air yards traveled before the ball is caught. And he doesn't just lead it. He leads in front of second place by over 150 yards. Purdy is slinging it. And I know what you're saying. Can he do it without Christian McCaffrey? Can he do it without George Kittle? Can he do it without Debo Samuel? Well, he's done it without Christian McCaffrey all year. He's done it without Kittle and Debo for a game or two. He's proven that. And can he do it without Kyle Shanahan? Well, guess what? You don't got to worry about that right now because Kyle Shanahan's his coach and Purdy is taking advantage of one of the best systems in the NFL. So you can call him a system quarterback all you want. I don't really care because if Purdy was a first rounder from Alabama, from LSU, from Clemson, the national media would be finding ways to say, oh my, the, he's leading the NFL in air yards travel before the ball is caught. This is why he was a first rounder from Alabama. That Man, we were right. Were these national experts, we were right. But because he was a seventh round pick from Iowa State, it's all about finding ways to say he's not. This is why he, oh, man. yeah, he's a system quarterback. Of, co- of course he's doing this with, with Christian McCaffrey. That, that's why he was the 262nd pick in the NFL draft. Give me a break. I don't think Brock Purdy is a Patrick Mahomes, a Josh Allen, a Lamar Jackson, but he has cemented himself as one of the elite quarterbacks in the in in the NFL. And whether you want to say that number is four or eight, I don't really care. Purdy is in that conversation. And I'm I'm kind of sick and tired of of the conversation that he's not. Great point. No, I agree with everything you said. The the lack of respect for Brock Purdy at times is still amazes me to this day. Like all the guy has done is just prove everybody wrong time and time again. I mean, eventually he's going to win a Super Bowl. Like he's going to go get over that Chiefs hump and that Super Bowl hump. He's going to win. He's going to bring back a title to San Francisco at some point. Well, did you see he's number one through, gosh, I should have written it down, through 25 starts. He's number one all time ranking ahead of Patrick Mahomes and Kurt Warner in total QBR. I know QBR and passer rating and all that stuff can be a little bit flawed, but Anytime you're in a conversation with Patrick Mahomes and Kurt Warner to start a career, you're probably doing something right. And should Kyle Shanahan get a lot of credit? Absolutely. Should Christian McCaffrey and Debo and and George Kittle? Absolutely, they should get credit. But in line with those guys, Brock Purdy deserves just as much credit for getting those guys the ball. Rant over. Rant over. But, uh, man, another good show, and we're, we're right into the thick of it. We're, we are right in the thick of Big 12 season, and it is getting interesting. I would imagine we'll have an overreaction next week 
to some team losing or winning, and I would imagine we'll have the same the following week because that's been the type of year it's been so far in the Big 12. I think that's all I got. You got any any parting thoughts? I, I think I said everything I need to say here in the show, so I think I'm good. Well, like, subscribe, leave a review, leave a five-star review. Tell your friends, tell your relatives, tell anybody you see on the street to listen to Iowa Everywhere. This thing's going to the moon, baby. Thanks for tuning in to Bigger Than 12 on Iowa Everywhere. Everywhere.